this series, I'm, I'm really trying to expand your view of who God is and grow in your understanding of how big God is so that you might step into things that you never dreamed of before because you believe that there's a God that's bigger than anything that you're going to face. And on this Thanksgiving weekend, um, one of the things I want to focus on is just this mindset of thankfulness and gratitude and how it relates to our picture of who God is. And so I wanted to step into a story that's found in Luke chapter 17. And um, it's a story uh, of Jesus interacting with a few people and um, starts out in verse 12. As Jesus continued toward Jerusalem, so he's heading toward Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. And as he entered a certain village there, ten men with leprosy stood at a distance, crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Now, uh, leprosy uh, communities, leprosy kind of represents a a wide range of uh, physical skin diseases. And in that culture... Um, You know what, like if you had a skin disease, it generally is contagious or was considered so, and you are immediately quarantined. And you know, the thing about uh, something like leprosy, as well as all sicknesses that we face, is that they're not a respecter of persons. Like, you know, whether you're rich or poor, whether you're male or female, whether you're, you know, foreigner or Israelite, that didn't matter who you were. Like, sickness affects us all. And same thing, in, in leprosy, it affected all sorts of people at all walks of life. But, but what it did for them was it completely removed them from everyday life. They were literally quarantined, set outside the city, and that was essentially their life until their disease was gone or until they died. And so to, be, to contract this and to be identified, that meant you were immediately removed really for the foreseeable future, was pretty much a lifetime sentence for you to be removed and quarantined with with other people in your same situation. And so Jesus is is heading up to, you know, the outskirts of the city, and this is what he comes up on. I I thought, I've always, you know, grew up and read about this story and thinking about leprosy and thinking that was just something that happened thousands of years ago. And, uh, you know, we've kind of you know, progressed as a society to where that's not, you know, really a, a problem. And honestly, here it, it's not. But, you know, around the world, there are still leper colonies. There are still places where, like, if you contract this kind, you know, of, of any sort of what, what would be considered contagious skin disease, you are immediately sent to a leper colony. I um, have visited one of these in, uh, in the outskirts of the capital city of Ethiopia. And, um, you know, it's, 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 it's positioned on the largest landfill trash dump that uh, I've ever seen, uh, where a new trash truck that comes in is greeted with a stream of people following it because it's fresh trash that uh, people haven't dug through before. And on the, on the edge, on the back edge of that, is this little leper colony. And, you know, when I heard about it, it just it kind of struck me like, that still exists? Like, let's go there. And, um, and I walked those streets and uh, came back. And I said, told, when, when my wife was gone, I was like, Mindy, you've got to go. And you, you just got to feel what it's like to, to, to be walking in those streets. Some of the, the greatest pictures that we have um, from our times in Ethiopia are in that leper community on some of our first trips. And you just, you just are struck by the fact that this, you know, that we're reading about, it's, it's real. And this is the situation that people live in today. And this is the situation that Jesus kind of comes up on. Desperate, desperate, desperate people. And here's the thing about desperate people. Um, Desperate people, they, they have no pretense. They have nothing to protect. They have no image to uphold. Uh, desperation isn't valued in our society at all. In fact, the only time that, um, that we in our society get really desperate is actually when we have a physical sickness, 
or ailment that there's no cure for, that there's no doctor or no prescription that can kind of cover up the symptoms. I mean, you feel the physical struggle of, of pain, and you get real prayerful real fast. Um, it, it's one of the things that uh, some of you maybe have experienced this past week because some of you joined us in fasting. And um, I walked in this morning and talked to a few of the staff. I was like, you know, it's the first time I talked to them this week. And I said, hey, you know, how did, uh, how did fasting go for you? And the comments ranged from awful to my husband's never doing this again to um, it's the worst spiritual discipline in the history of spiritual disciplines. Uh, I don't know why we do this. All right, so that's your spiritual leaders right there for you, all right? And, but, but here's the thing about it, okay? You think it's funny, but listen, some of you, maybe that's the first time you fasted. Let me tell you, it doesn't get any better. It doesn't matter how spiritual you are, fasting doesn't get any easier. It's the, like, great, like, you know, you might be thinking, like, if you haven't prayed very much, and you're around somebody who prays all the time, and you can kind of know, like, where you rank, you know what I'm saying? Same thing with Bible, like, you know, some people know their way around the Bible, and they, it's kind of just flows a little bit easier, and you're kind of awkward with, I don't know where that book is, what is it, you know. Fasting's not like that. With fasting, we're all terrible, okay? I, I mean, I had a five-day headache. You know what I was convicted of? I was convicted of how much caffeine I drink. I mean, seriously, because I thought, eh, it's not a big deal. Well, it's a big deal if you have a headache for five days because you haven't had your caffeine fix, all right? And I'm a miserable person when I'm fasting. I mean, just ask my wife or kids. And, um, and they're miserable too, okay? Because they're not more spiritual than I am. But, but it's like the great, like it creates a genuine desperation. Like your body tells you this is not normal. And you're desperate for whatever you, you are used to having. And listen, like, that's part of the reason that we should fast. It, it, it mimics, it reflects what our souls need, what our spirits need from God. When, when Christ comes you know, on this earth, he, he calls himself the daily bread. I am literally manna from heaven. I am that provision. And he's reflecting back to a, a, you know, an Old Testament story when they're in the wilderness and God provided manna for them every day. Every morning, they needed to go out and get what they needed. And it only lasted for the day, so they had to go back out the next day because that's the desperation. It's the need keeps on coming every day. That is the need of your souls. And that's what Jesus is saying when he says, hey, I, I am the bread of life. I am what your soul needs. And let me tell you, you might have masked that over, but you got to realize that without a daily intake of God's Word, of time with Christ, time with God in prayer, time speaking and listening, your soul is like your body on a 30-day fast. It's desperate. But let me tell you, even though we avoid being desperate, when we are desperate, we tend to reach out for something that is greater than ourselves. Okay? Some of you that never go to the doctor, ever. You've gotten to the desperate, desperate places of physical pain or struggle, and you're like, okay, I'll go. And you, you literally submit yourself and all of your failed wisdom that has failed to correct the issue or the problem to somebody who is greater. One of the reasons that God is not greater in your life is because you are not desperate. You're fine. It's one of the struggles of being uh, in suburbia is... Desperation doesn't look good on suburbia. Desperation is not acceptable here. When you're desperate here, you put your house on a short sale, or you're foreclosed and you move somewhere else. Desperation doesn't look good on us 
nor do we stretch for it, nor do we reach for it. We avoid it at all cost. And yet, it's the one path that causes us to reach out for something greater. And some of the reasons that you don't believe in a God who is greater is because your heart and your soul are not desperate, and, or they are, and you just don't want to recognize it. These people in this leper colony, they throw caution to the wind. They don't have any other hope. They are desperate. They are a lifetime ban. This is the rest of your life. Welcome to it. And so when they hear the hope of a guy who they just heard stories about, who maybe have healed somebody, who they don't even know if it's true, but hey, it's their only hope or it's the best chance they've got, and they say, Jesus, have mercy on us. And so Jesus looked at them and said, go show yourself to the priest. Now that's interesting. That, like, this is Jesus' recorded words. Go show yourself to the priest. Go do that. I mean, I, like, it just doesn't even make sense. Now listen, in that day, if you had leprosy and you felt like you had been cured, that's exactly the pathway of cure, is you would go and show yourself to the priest and the priest would certify you as cleansed and you could re-enter society. So it was like, go and show yourself to this person that is your key to getting back into your daily life. You know, for some of these guys, they probably hadn't seen their family in years and years and years. They pretty much were relegated to this as the rest of their life. And, and Jesus said, hey, go show yourself to the priest. Look, I, I, the way this story reads, they had, nothing had changed about their physical condition at this point. And it's not like God said, or Jesus said, go show yourself to the priest, I'm going to heal you, or you're healed, look at your skin, you're cleansed, now go show yourself to the priest. He literally just says to them, go show yourself to the priest. And as the story reads, they went. It feels as though they go a good ways away from Jesus. It's not you know, detailed in this story, but that's how I feel this, this story goes. And as we keep reading it, you'll, you'll understand. It's, I think they got at least out of sight of Jesus is how the story feels. And so from the moment that Jesus said this, they're on their way to the priest, and, and they're, they're on their road. From the moment that Jesus said something, to the realization that they are healed. Because as they were going, they are cleansed of their leprosy. Listen, this is the space where faith exists. Okay? It's true for all of our situations. The distance between where God says, do this. To the point where you are realizing in reality, the blessing or the result of that step of obedience, this is the space that's called faith. You know what faith looks like? Faith looks like obedience in the absence of results. What we have faith in? We have faith in Christ to save our souls, to, to connect us to God's family, that we could be forever with Him. It's, it's faithful obedience until the day where we fully realize being in God's family forever. The full realization of face-to-face -face with Jesus. Until that day, it's faith. Let me tell you, when you get to heaven, there is no more room for faith. There's no more room for belief. It's reality. Jesus says, go show yourself to the priest, and they go. And they go without a discernible change in their reality. And then as they're going, they look down and their, their skin is cleansed. It's healed. And this is the space for faith. At the moment that they are healed, there's no more belief for them. There's no more faith for them. It's reality. It's what is. But the time from the step of obedience until the time of the realization of that promise, that's the space for faith. One of the reasons that your God is not bigger than he is and you don't sense a greatness of God in your life is because there are some things that God is asking you to do and you want the results first. 
or you want that the, the, the space between obedience and realization to be this close. I mean, you're kind of like, yeah, well, God tells me all to do that. Yeah, well, I tried that once, and, and, and I lasted this long, and I didn't see any results, so it just doesn't work. Hmm. When your space between obedience and results has to be so razor thin that, like, I'm going to follow you today, but tomorrow better be different, God. I'm going to follow you today, but, like, this week's got to happen. That is a sign of a, a very small faith, a very small God. When we are obedient, we experience a God who is bigger. It's just the way it happens. What happens for these guys? They literally just took Jesus at his word and they took off. And as they're going in obedience to God, He heals them. I'm wondering, what are the things in your life that you're one step away from obedience, from, from experiencing? I mean, some of the blessings that feel like God is ready to pour out on you and on us as a church, it's, it's like, yeah, but if you just, like, just obey. We don't talk about obedience a whole lot. Unfortunately, we talk about grace, we talk about forgiveness, we talk about faith, we, you know, all this stuff that, that is like, okay, it's, it's just, the remedy for our disobedience is Jesus. And so we celebrate him because we are disobedient people, but at the same time, like, wow, man, sometimes God is just saying, will you trust me? Will you trust me with your time? Will you trust me? with your resources? Will you trust me with your family? Will you trust me? And some of you say, well, I've I've tried that before. It didn't work. Well, maybe you need to try it again. Because when we trust God in obedience, it honestly, it leads us to desperation. It leads us to a greater sense of reliance on God and a greater sense that His promises are true and a greater faith in a God who's bigger. Well, these guys were obedient, and it worked out really well for them. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus. This is kind of why I feel like they got away from Jesus, all ten of them heading towards the priest. I think maybe they didn't, maybe they just kind of took a slow pace at first, all right? And they started heading towards the priest in obedience, and then they kind of looked down And they realized they were healed. And at that moment, I think the pace picked up for them. At that moment, these guys are looking forward to everything that's ahead. They're looking forward to seeing their family again for the first time, to re-entering a society and all of their, you know, all the goods that come along with that, the goodness of being a part of family and being part of a community and enjoying daily life in that community. And they start picking up the pace because they can't wait to experience all that God has provided through them in this healing. But one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he came back to Jesus shouting, praise God. And he fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. And this man was a Samaritan. Now, Samaritans, they were half-breeds between Jewish people and Gentile. They were basically hated by both groups. They were kind of the lowest of the low. And Jesus often highlights their faith in contrast to the faith of the people of God, the Israelites. And my assumption with this is that the other nine were were Israelites. They were people who were born into the promises of God. They were God's people. And maybe because they were God's people, they kind of expected this kind of healing. It's almost like, well, finally. But this guy, he turned back. And he went to Jesus' feet. And he thanked him. 
And Jesus asked the man, didn't, didn't I heal ten men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? One of the reasons that God is not greater in your eyes is really a lack of thankfulness for what he has already done for you. You see, like when we are reminded of God's goodness, when we're called in the Psalms to forget not all his goodness, all his greatness, all his deeds, when, when we're reminded of all that he's done in the past in the scriptures and his faithfulness to his people, as well as when we're thankful in our hearts for the things that God has blessed us with, even though it's 10 years ago, even though it's 10 months ago, even though it's 10 days ago, when we're reminded of those things, our God gets bigger. When we're reminded of the, the things that he has brought us through the things that he has overcome in our lives, we start getting a bigger picture of a bigger God who can handle what's next. And one of the reasons that we're not experiencing that is we just don't have a thankful action in our life. Now listen, this is what I think about all 10 of these guys. And it's what I think about most of you. I think all 10 of these guys were very grateful. I don't know how you're not grateful. I mean, you, you, they, they go, they're healed, and they are grateful. There's no requirement. Like Jesus doesn't say, go show yourself to the priest, and when you're healed, make sure you come back and you know, thank me. I think all of them existed a heart of gratitude for Jesus. But gratitude is a feeling. Gratitude is an emotion. Thankfulness is an action. And, and what you need to do is, I believe you are very grateful people because you have a grateful heart. But that gratefulness and that emotion oftentimes never gets expressed in thankfulness to the people around you. An action. And look, as we move from people who are not just grateful, but people who act in thankfulness. We begin to believe in a God who is greater. Because when we act on the things, we point back to a God who is the source of that goodness. And the picture of who he is gets bigger. A few months ago, um, this is not a surprise in this service. It was a surprise in the first service, but that's the problem with having two services. You can only surprise one time. It's just the way it goes. Um, but uh, ab- about uh, two months ago, um, Don Burns, who's in our church, and Don, you mind coming up here? Um, when was your birthday, Don? August 7th. So however many months ago that is, all right? August 7th, Don Burns turned 60 years old. 60. I mean, that's old for our church, all right? I'm just surprised you can walk down that aisle, man. You can make those steps, look at you. There it is. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, I came in the Sunday after his birthday, and uh, um, some of you probably got this email. I vaguely remember getting this email, but Don's son is like a video genius, and so he and his wife, they kind of pushed out a little invite to everybody to shoot a little video about what Don means to them and, and how grateful they are for him and, and in their life and, and wish him a happy birthday. And, um, and what they did, he was telling me about it that next Sunday. He's like, man, like uh, we set up a movie screen on the back porch and you know, we all sat down as a family watching this movie. Was it Indiana Jones? All right. And so, like, we're going to watch, you know, old school Indiana Jones together. And the movie started, and right after the movie started, it kind of interrupted and broke into uh, how many videos? Like 81. Nobody's counting, but 81. 81 videos of 81 different people expressing, um, you know, happy birthday and just the thankfulness uh, to this guy. And uh, he told me that, and my heart was really sad. 
Because I, I, when he told me that, I, I thought, like, I think I did get that email. And um, you know what? I didn't do anything with it. Um, and I am a, I'm very grateful for this guy. Very grateful. But I didn't allow my gratefulness of, of a emotion to turn into a thankfulness of action. And so um, I'm going to use today to make up for that um, and let you know who this guy is. Um, Don has been a part of our church since we were in the movie theater, which means if you were at our church in the movie theater, that means you were a part of our church in 2000, 2001, or 2002. Okay? So there's maybe six of you. All right? Um, maybe a few more that I'm missing. Maybe 10 or 12. Um, but that's... And then... Um, he was a part of our elder board and has been a part of that since about 2004, I'm thinking. Um, so for the last 12 years, God has used this man as a part of a team to kind of steer this, this ship uh, or keep this car between the ditches, all right? And, um, and this is what 2 Timothy chapter 3 says, 1 Timothy chapter 3 says about what an elder is supposed to be. It says, so an elder must be a man whose life is above reproach. Um, in all the years that I've known Don, I have never heard anyone um, say something like negative, like, oh, you know, Don, he's this way. Never. He must be faithful to his wife. And if you know Sue, you can ask her about his faithfulness. He must exercise self-control and live wisely and have a good reputation. He must enjoy having guests in his home. One of the first times I even remember hearing um, the Burns is I heard they had a house that hosts a bunch of people. And um, my brother-in-law was the college pastor at the time. And we were looking for a place to do some college dinners to get it out of our house and to get somebody else's house. And uh, I said, well, why don't you call the Burns? And so... Uh, I said, hey, how'd that go? And my brother-in-law was like, dude, this place is awesome. Like, and they are awesome. I mean, there was tons of people. There. I was like, what do you mean tons of people? Well, they had Young Life. They host Young Life there. And I was like, yeah, I knew that. That's kind of why I asked you to, you know, see about college dinner. Well, they were hosting Young Life that night. That night upstairs in their house. And they said, yeah, we got room for college dinner downstairs now. And so... Two groups all in there. And, you know, since that time, I mean, they've hosted hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people in their home. He must not, um, he must be able to teach. He must not be a heavy drinker or be violent. He must be gentle. Guys, this is the gentlest man I've ever met in my life. And um, when you talk about gentleness, I think there's some gentle people, but um, they're only gentle because they're just passive. I mean, it's easy to be gentle if you're not trying to get anything done. Yeah? And so I don't count that as gentleness. Um, but when you're steering something, when you're leading something, when you're engineering something different, it's easy to be like, need this done now. Let's do this. It's easy to kind of push and, and Don has been consistently gentle. Not quarrelsome, not love money. He must manage his own family well, having children who respect and obey him. For if a man cannot manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? Don has two kids. How many grandkids? Three, Three grandkids. Um, his kids still come back and visit him, and they like it. And that's a good thing. Um, uh, an elder must not be a new believer because he might become proud and the devil would cause him to fall. Also, people outside the church must speak well of him so that he will not be disgraced and fall into the devil's trap. And I thought, this is what describes this guy. He's generous. I mean, generous. This guy pours out his resources. 
to people who are in need, to people around him, to this church, just over and over again. He's always ready with a story. Always. If you know Don, he's always like, hey, i got to tell you about. And it's always about God's faithfulness. Mostly in relation to money of some sort. I mean, I can remember story after story, different things. But the one that stands out, I mean, there's a ton that stand out. But like this one was like, hey, I, you know, we, we really needed a new stove. And, you know, we host people all the time. And my wife wanted this stove. And it was... $5,000 stove, okay, not just a normal stove, and they had some money, I don't know what they were planning, you were, like, we were sending people away on, on the mission field is what we are doing, and he's like, you know what, I think God wants us to take this money and, and do that, and so we did that, and, and that day, I don't know where you found this, his brother found the exact stove for $40. No, she needed a stove. That's what he wanted for her. You know, and, and look, this is not a special story, okay? This is one of hundreds that I've heard for the last 13, 14 years. And if you know Don, you've heard him too. He's always bold on what's right and what's wrong. It's easy to be gentle and passive if you just let everybody be everybody never confront anybody's sin, never challenge anybody with you know, their disobedience, or never challenge anybody to be more generous. That's easy to be gentle at that point. It's harder to be bold about what is right and what's wrong and consistently be gentle and caring and kind. He's always inviting. I'm pretty confident that there's two or three people in the church that are running way ahead of everybody else of how many people they've invited here throughout the years. And Don's way, way up there. I'm pretty sure he invites more people to this church than I do. I'm confident of that. That's pretty bad, but it's true. Always thinking about how God's kingdom can advance. He's always using the, 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 the thoughts that, that God brings to him. He's taking them captive. He's trying to figure out how can we be better, do better, reach more, love more, care more. Colossians 3 says, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourself with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults. When I'm frustrated as a pastor at the faults of many of you throughout the years, it's just sometimes it just builds up and I get ticked and we're in a meeting talking about it because it's become bigger than just an individual. You know, it's affecting a group of people, and now it's a topic. And I'm pretty right in my diagnosis, okay? I'm just telling you, sometimes I am, most of the time. But even in my rightness, Don's like, well, you know, Dave, we really ought to make allowances for people's faults. I'm like, just shut up with the Bible, will you, Don? You know? You know, he, like, he's always calling that back. He's the most gracious person I know. I mean, grace in action. Grace when he's been offended. Grace when it costs him something. Make allowance for others' faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. And always be thankful that the message about Christ and all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other. With all the wisdom he gives, sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as representative of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks through him to God the Father. This is who, um, this is who you are to me. And uh, I know this is who you are to this place because you proved it over and over again. And I want to move from being grateful to really being thankful to you. And so... Um, this is, a, this is a weird representation of, of my thankfulness. Um, this is a good little old school water bucket. 
you know, like well, water bucket, dip it down, fill it up. Um, the reality is, is I've given, this would be my second water bucket that I've given away. I've decided that this is the, um, this is the Lifetime Achievement Award of this church, okay? Um, the first one I gave out was to uh, Robert Wright, Robert and Ann Wright, because um, they moved a couple years ago, and uh, they had just helped engineer something really different in this church and been a part of elder team and served in a hundred different ways uh, for 10, 12 years. And, um, and, you know, as they were leaving their last Sunday here before they left, then I, uh, I gave them one of these. And I just decided, like, like we don't need to wait for people to leave uh, to do this. And so uh, this is why this stood out to me, Don. Um, like this bucket is filled up with the intent to immediately be emptied out. I mean, that's what it's for, right? I mean, you dip it down in the well and you fill it up so that as soon as you get it up, it's poured out. And um, there's a lot of lives that get filled up, and, but they never pour out. God fills them up, intending them to be a blessing to people around them, and they just hold on to them. For, for themselves, and, um, and you don't do that, and so I hope that as you see this in your home, that it'll remind you of our gratitude and thankfulness to you for years and years and years, and that this is what we think about you, because I know that God fills you up, that you go to his well to fill you up, and when you're full, you immediately look around to people and figure out, how can I pour myself out into them, and I just want to say thanks. Careful on those steps, bud. I don't want anybody breaking hips this morning, all right? That's what I do. Easy. Um, unfortunately, uh, I am a very grateful person, um, but not very thankful person. And I think it's true of many of you, too. I'm pretty confident that you're grateful. But it's your busy schedule. Pa, I, think I, I, remember, I remember feeling that, like, why didn't I do that? Why didn't I take time to shoot a video and send it in? Why didn't I do that? And I, I remember, like, immediately, oh, it's been a busy summer. I've had this, had this, had this, had this, had this. Like, all the excuses, just all the justifications just rolled up in my mind and, and, and really let me off the hook. But, guys, if we're not expressing, if we're not expressing it, we're holding, we're holding God back. Move from, from, from being grateful people that I know you are to, to the action of thankfulness. And as we move from being grateful to being thankful, we'll, we'll believe in a God who's bigger. Let me show you what God does in this guy, okay? Because he moves from being grateful to actually expressing it in thankfulness. And Jesus said to the man, verse 19, stand up and go, your faith has healed you. Literally, the phrase here is your faith has saved you. If you'll do any Bible study on that word, it's probably a better translation, saved you. It is not talking about his physical healing at this point. He's already been healed. Yes, his obe- I, it's grace that, that healed him. Okay? They went in obedience to Jesus' words for whatever reason. Hey, whatever hope, what other hope we got, we're going. And they were healed, physically healed. But then he returns and moves from grateful heart to a thankfulness expressed to Jesus. And Jesus says that faith, that faith that says it is a God who's done this, that faith that says there is a God who is greater That faith that allowed God to get bigger in his mind. 
saved him. Remember, he's an outsider. He's not an Israelite. He's outside of God's promises, outside of God's family. And his faith is what Jesus is saying. Your faith has saved you and brought you into God's family. I think there's a lot that God has in store for you if you will allow God to get bigger in your mind and if you will move from just having a grateful heart to literally being thankful, particularly to him. Listen, it's what prayer is really about. It's stopping. It's recognizing. If you, if you don't spend much time in prayer, I'm pretty confident you're grateful. You just don't express it. You're not thankful. You don't tell God. You don't spend time saying. You say, oh, well, God knows. If, if you don't digest his word daily, you just... You're, you're not moving from thankful to, I mean, from grateful to, to being thankful and, and investing of yourself. You, you're really, you're not desperate enough. And because of these things, we're limiting what God wants to do in our hearts and lives. And so spend some time thinking, God, how do I become more thankful? How do I move from just a grateful heart to, to an expressed gratitude and thankful? And make it happen. Take the time. Investment. And see what God does in your lives and your relationships as you trust Him. Let's pray. God, thank You for Your love for us. Thank You for a simple story. It leads us to a challenging conclusion. I pray, Father, that we wouldn't miss this. And in all that we hope for and all that we look forward to, all that we dream about, that the simplicity of pausing, of investing time and being thankful, and the difference that it can make in our entire perspective. I pray, Father, that you would help us to be that um, in our lives with you, in our marriages, in our families, in our schools, in our communities, in our world. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys have a great week.